So it seems that there's no hope for northern Israel. There was no conceivable hope for northern Israel to return to a marriage covenant with Yehovah or for Judah and Israel to ever reunite. Now, reconciliation with her groom would, according to Yehovah's own commandments, result in abomination and the land becoming defiled. Nevertheless, Yehovah passionately called his wayward wife to return, that is, repent, to him, and presumably he would have to find a way to work things out, all right? And he's God, he's pretty good at that, right? So we find that in Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 6, God is, is now, of course, Jeremiah is speaking for God, and God says, they say, all right? So God is now quoting what people are saying, all right? And he says, they say, if a man divorces his wife and she goes from him and become another man's wife, may he return to her again. Would not that land be greatly polluted? But you have played the harlot with many lovers. Yet return, shuvi is the word, shuvi elai to me, says Yehovah. Yehovah said also to me in the days of Josiah the king, that's in the south, have you seen what backsliding Israel in the north has done. She has gone up on every high mountain and under every green tree and there played the harlot. And I said after she had done all these things, Shuvialai, return to me, but she did not return. She did not repent. And her treacherous sister Judah in the south saw it. Then I saw that for all the causes for which backsliding Israel had committed adultery, and I'd put her away and given her a certificate of divorce, yet her treacherous sister Judah did not fear, but went and played the harlot also. And yet for all this, her treacherous sister Judah has not turned to me with her whole heart, but in pretense, says Yehovah. Now keep in mind that when Jeremiah is writing, we're now coming up really close to the end of the southern kingdom of Judah. Nebuchadnezzar came and in three different waves, first he came in 605, then 597 BC, and finally in 586 BC, and in the last campaign against Jerusalem, he raised the city to the ground, he destroyed the temple, and he took away the rest of the cream of the crop uh, over to Babylon. So in the days of Jeremiah, we're getting really close to the end of Judah. Well, what about the northern kingdom of Israel? Where are they? They are not up there. They're not there. They've been replaced. The king of Assyria had a policy that he would take people from neighboring countries that he had conquered, and he would put them into a different country. So the people from country A, the captives, got transferred to the area of country B, and the people from uh, B went over to country A. And so now you have what we know as the Samaritans. They're now a mixed breed. Again, he didn't take all of the Israelites away, the northern kingdom, but he took most of them away. Uh, and so now you begin having this mixed bag. All right. So he says, Then Yehovah said to me, Backsliding Israel has shown herself more righteous than treacherous Judah. Go and proclaim these words toward the north. All right. So look, Jeremiah is now being given a message to the northern kingdom of Israel that is not there. All right, he's saying, look, Judah, who's still existing at that time, is really awful. But now speak to the north, but they're not there. That's the trouble. They've already been taken away. It's been 130 years approximately, 140 years that they've been out. They've been gone. And yet God is saying, return, shuv, or shuvi, backsliding Israel says Yehovah, I will not cause my anger to fall on you, for I am merciful, says Yehovah. I will not remain angry forever. This is the heart and the soul of the gospel, is to return because God has made a way for you to come back into the kingdom. All right, so that is kind of a little bit of a foreshadow to the new covenant we're going to talk about very soon. But right now we're still looking at the old covenant. And I want you to understand here that the Old Covenant is not just that God had this, these do's and don'ts and in the New Covenant all of that stuff is done away with. That's not true. That is just not true. The covenant has to do with the marriage covenant, the marriage contract 
between Yehovah, God, and Israel. And then we have this divorce, and now we've got this problem. How do you get God and his wife back together without breaking the law? So he says, God says, only acknowledge your iniquity, that you have transgressed against Yehovah your God, and have scattered your charms to alien deities under every green tree, and you have not obeyed my voice, says Yehovah. Return, O backsliding children, says Yehovah, for I am married to you. That is Baalti. That's the kind of a pun in that word there. The word Baal, of course, is uh, Baal in English. Uh, so that the false god Baal, and they were going after the Baalim, after the Baals of the land, and they were constantly giving their adoration and their worship and their allegiance and their love to this God instead of to the one true God who actually married her. And he says, look, I am married to you. I am uh, married, Baalti. He says, I'm the one who's your husband, your Baal, okay, really. And I will take you, one from a city and two from a family, and I will bring you to Zion. So God has a plan to get Israel back, talking of the northern kingdom. He's got a plan for the southern kingdom too. We're going to look at that as well, of course. So the divine solution, the way to reverse the curse, we have to ask ourselves the question, how could Israel be brought back into a marriage covenant without Yehovah violating his own law? Again, Deuteronomy 24, 4a, then her former husband, Yehovah, who divorced her, Israel, must not take her Israel back to be his wife after she has been defiled for that is an abomination before Yehovah. So it's absolutely impossible according to the law for God to just take her back. Even though he's saying come on back to me she can't just come on back. She can't do that. And that's why God even says they say that if a man has a wife and he divorces her can she come back? Of course not. The land would be defiled. But he says even for all that come on back to me. And again, this is what's so amazing, is that God had a plan. And this is the big mystery that the prophets of old, and probably the angels too, were looking into and saying, how in the world is God going to do this? It seems absolutely impossible. So the only way that the wife, that is the northern kingdom of Israel, could be released of her fate of having been put away, the shlicha, and divorced, the kritut, was for Yehovah, her husband, to die, which would annul and dissolve the original marriage contract. Well, you know, that seems like a fat chance, right? I mean, if you're married to God, uh, if the only way to be released from that marriage contract is for your husband to die, and your husband happens to be God, and God doesn't die, what are you going to do? You're pretty much, you know, out of luck. You're out of hope. There's nothing that can happen. But is that really the case? Well, it sure seemed that way. It sure seemed like there was no hope. There was nothing that could happen. And then, of course, one day, everything changed. And the Apostle Paul got very excited about this when he kind of put the pieces together. He said, do you realize what's happening here? Do you realize the, mag the, the magnitude of what has just happened? Let me explain this thing to you. So he understood that when using the law to explain, he reminded the Jews who knew the law that their law only has jurisdiction over a person until that person's death. All right, so Paul writing the book of Romans, he's writing to a mixed crowd, to Jews and to non-Jews, right, which we call Gentiles. Gentile is a word coming from Latin gens, and it means peoples. If you look at it in the Greek, it means ethnos, which again just means peoples. And so now it's all coming together. It's, it's how to get these two people back together. Paul then says, Or do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. For a woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she's released from the law of her husband. Did you catch that? First of all, Paul says he's speaking to those, to those who know the law. So that's the first very important established uh, fact that we have to establish here, 
is that Paul is writing to those who have an understanding of the law. If you don't have an understanding of the law, then you're going to be a little bit lost as to what Paul is really trying to say. If you know the law, then you're going to go, oh, I get it. I know what Paul's talking about. So Paul then says, for the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she's released from the law of her husband. So he's referring back to Deuteronomy 24, verses 1 through 4. And again, the Jews listening would have said, oh yeah, I know that passage. I know what he's talking about. She's bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. That's what the law says. But then Paul says, but wait, but if the husband dies, she's released from the law of her husband. And of course, everybody would have said, well, of course, that makes perfect sense. Once the guy dies, she's released. That's not a problem. But notice here, it's very, super, very important. The law of her husband. Paul is not talking about the law in general. He's talking about the law of her husband. I just can't stress that enough. The law of her husband is what she's released from, not, not the good instructions that God gave. Is that, okay, now, it's, now you can kill. It's okay. Now you can do whatever you feel like. Now you can steal. Now you can uh, bear false witness. Of course you can't do those things. You're still, those are still good. Those are still true. So the thing that she's released from is the law of her husband. And he goes on to explain how the wife is freed from the law of the husband. That is the marriage contract. So then, if while her husband, Yehovah, lives, she, Israel, marries another man, that is the Baal, etc. So again, what he's saying here is, so if while her husband lives, and of course, Israel was married to, Je to Yehovah, she is cons uh, if she marries another man, think of the, uh, the golden calf, Baal, Ashtoreth, Molech, Milcom, and all these false gods, she will be called an adulteress. Now, what did God call her? You're an adulterous wife. You're so adulterous. You're, you're treacherous. He says, but if her husband dies, she's free from that law. Notice, it's that law. It's not, again, the good instructions called the Torah that God gave, but it's this specific contract so that she is no adulteress, though she has married another man. So again, he's not suggesting that the entire Torah that were given the, uh, at, at Sinai, that the laws that God gave at Sinai, he's not saying those are repealed, not at all. He's saying that the marriage contract that she broke, that she was guilty of breaching, she's now free from that law, the law of the husband not the Torah in general. That's the huge difference. And Paul is excited about this. He's explaining it to those who know the law. The trouble is, a lot of people come to Romans chapter 7 with zero knowledge of the law, and they start reading it, and they say, well, I, I, I know it good enough. Well, they don't. They don't know it because it doesn't make any sense because they don't know the law. And so then they just think that Paul's coming up with this cute little example you know, of, of you know, what Jesus did for us and all this. Well, yeah, I mean, Jesus did this for us, but what does it mean? What is he getting at? He's talking about this marriage that was broken, and now that marriage contract can be laid to rest. He says, therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law. Which law is he talking about? The law of her husband, right? That's called an antecedent. We have to go back and say, well, which law is he talking about? He's already defined it for us, the law of her her husband it says so he's now she is or you also have become dead to the law of her husband through the body of Christ that you may be married to another all right so what's he getting at here Jesus is Emmanuel he is God in the flesh right if you've seen me you've seen the father Yeshua says all right now again without getting into the whole um, hypostatic union and all that stuff. All right, that's for another video. But in this case, all we have to think about is that Jesus is the visible bodily manifestation, visitation of God. He's come and he went to the cross and he died. So, he is the husband that died. 
right? So he, so she was married to Jesus essentially when he went to the cross. And guess what? Her husband died on the cross. So now she's free from that law. She's free from the marriage covenant that she broke. And so, so then he died. He stayed in the tomb three days, right? He was dead. He was out for the count. He didn't come back. But guess what? This other guy rose from the dead, all right? Now, again, I think it's the same Jesus that died, but legally, legally, it's a new guy, okay? I get it. The same Jesus that was nailed to the cross and put in the tomb is the same one that raised from the dead. I, I'm not saying otherwise. All I'm trying to help articulate here is that from a legal standpoint, when Jesus died and was buried, that broken contract was also buried with him. And when he rose from the dead, it was as if, legally, he was a new guy. So legally, he is a new guy. And now, he, you know, he's the same personality, he's the same creator, but he's a new guy because the old contract has now been put to rest. That old contract is dead. And now there's a new contract so that he can enter into with his wife this new marriage contract. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. So again, Paul says, Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead. So who is the other? Well, it's Jesus, right? So Jesus died on the cross. So that Jesus, let's call that Jesus 1 and Jesus 2, okay? All right, so Jesus 1 is nailed to the cross. He's then put into the tomb. He's dead. And then Jesus 2 now rises from the dead, and he's like a different Jesus, right? And, uh, and again, I'm just footnoting here because I'm sure there's somebody that's going to say, well, Doug, you're talk you, you believe in two different gods. No, I don't believe in one God. I believe in the same Jesus, <laughs> okay, <laughs> right? The same one that died, rose again. But from a legal standpoint, he's a new entity. He's a new entity from a legal standpoint. So now you're married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. But if the husband dies, she's released from the law of her husband. There it is again in Romans 7, 2. I put that there just to, to drive home that point that we're talking about the law of the husband. We're talking about the marriage contract. We're not talking about all the good instructions of don't murder and don't steal, etc. We're not talking about those. Those are simply the things that are on God's heart. And those things are still on God's heart. So the curses of the broken marriage contract died with Yeshua, died with Jesus, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements. So what, what, were, these, uh, what were these curses? Well, the, the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, what was it? Well, in the law it says, look, if you are an adulterer, then you deserve to die. You deserve to be, you know, at the very least, divorced and sent away, and you can never come back, and there's not going to be any relationship. You're forever in exile. That's the good case. That's a good scenario. The bad scenario is that you die. So that was against us. These are certainly con these are uh, handwriting of requirements that's against us, contrary to us. He has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. You see. Some, a lot of people read this and they say, well, you know, the, the Ten Commandments and all that stuff, God got rid of that. No, you guys, God has kept his Ten Commandments. Those are of utmost importance in God's economy. He's not going to get rid of those. Those are still incredibly significant. He's still against murder. He's still against thievery. He's still against bearing false witness against your neighbor. He's still against adultery. He's still against coveting. He's still for honoring your parents. He's still for keeping the Sabbath, right? He's still for having no other gods before him. He's still for not taking his name in vain, right? I mean, he's still for all of these things. He, those are still on his heart. Those have not changed one bit. But yet we've been told this lie that 
all those things changed because those things, those Ten Commandments were nailed to the cross. That is incorrect, to put it nicely. All right, so the, again, the contract there at the beginning, the first one, was sealed with blood. At the first covenant, cut at Sinai, the book of the covenant, that is the marriage contract, was proclaimed, and then the blood of bulls was sprinkled in order to seal the deal. And that's in the same way how today we sign a contract, and then we have it notarized and filed with the city clerk. It's the blood that made the contract effective, operable, and binding. So the contract, again, sealed with blood. Then it says, he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that Yehovah said we will do and be obedient. And Moses took the blood, sprinkled it on the people and said, this is the blood of the covenant, which Yehovah has made with you according to all these words. Again, what words? You can look at it yourself from chapter 20 through chapter 23. It's only four chapters. So the blood made the contract effective, operable, and binding. After the people heard, had heard all the conditions of the contract, they said, I do, and gladly accepted the marriage contract with Yehovah. They agreed to be faithful to him and to do all that he had asked them to do, which is what we always do when we enter into an agreement or a contract, right? I mean, that's what you expect. And if somebody doesn't do what is in the contract, you're shocked. You're like, well, they didn't keep their end of the, of the bargain, right? And, and you have to work it out somehow. In the case of marriage, you have to either get counseling or it may dissolve in a divorce. So with the new covenant, this is now the new marriage contract with Jesus, let's just say God, okay, for simplicity, with God who married Israel back at Mount Sinai. She was an adulterous wife. And so God goes on the cross to put that contract into the grave and now Jesus too okay the, this new husband rises from the dead and now he can marry the same woman because she's no longer considered an adulteress she's no longer considered to be under that curse because she broke the covenant so the blood, Jesus' blood in this case, was offered to seal the deal just like the first covenant. That's why Jesus says, For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Now, the second marriage contract is, of course, greater than the first. The nature of the blood sacrifice was of immeasurably greater quality than that of the first covenant. Additionally, the one who would officiate the sacrifice would not be Moses, a Levite, but one of the order of Melchizedek. So in this, the husband died to dissolve the old marriage, but at the same time, his blood became the blood of the new covenant, and he also was the one who offered the blood on that heavenly altar that we read about in the book of Hebrews where it says, but Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, like it was in the first one, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. And then, Paul tells us in Colossians 1, And you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. So the, 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 the wife is now free from the curse of the broken marriage covenant, now free from the curse of her broken marriage covenant, Israel could actually remarry without being called an adulteress. Now, how could she be rejoined to her groom if he was in the grave? Okay, so this, I hope, makes sense here, right? So Jesus dies on the cross. He goes into the tomb, right? So now the stigma of being an adulteress is no longer applicable to her because her husband has died. So you can't be an adulteress if your husband's dead. So for three days, Israel, the adulterous wife, has now become a widow because her husband actually died. But that's no fun 
because the whole point of what God wanted to do was to not just stay dead so that she could have that stain removed. I mean, that was very important. But the whole point was so he could remarry her because he made promises to her to come back to him and he would work things out and that he married her forever and will love her forever. So if Yeshua remained dead, then no remarriage between him and Israel could take place despite her new freedom. Therefore, Yeshua had to not only die to free Israel, but he had to also rise from the dead so that she could remarry her former husband, who was in reality a new husband from a legal standpoint. Pretty exciting when you start to look at this. So now